All right, we are now live for another AMA. That's Ask Me Anything session. Let's see if we get the lights up a little bit. I know that sometimes people uh, uh, think these are a little bit dark, not just because of the content, but because of the, there we go, the lighting. So we've got a couple questions already lined up in advance, um, some of which are better than others. You can. Damn it, Albert says, do you agree with some of the more extreme interpretations of Foucault that suggest that a real me, uninfluenced by my society's discourses and epi epistemes or epistems, however we want to pronounce that, doesn't actually exist? Um, yeah, I mean, and so would most ancient philosophers and medieval philosophers, uh, depending on what you mean by real me, I mean... You don't have to go to Foucault to think that we are influenced incredibly by society. That's a viewpoint of Plato and Aristotle and Epicurus. Think about the role that vain or uh, illusory opinions play. This is not something radically new. The notion that there is some sort of core that's you that's like totally unchanging and and would be, you know, unaffected by any sort of cultural things is, is a little bit um, a little bit of a, a, an odd notion. Um, I don't know too many people who buy into that. Or if they do, they're like, well, you got like the transcendental ego and it does its thing. And then you've got your empirical self. Um, now, maybe you're asking about something else like, you know, is there like nothing that we can take for granted or no local continuities or anything like that? Um, but I don't, I don't see that as like a particularly, uh, extreme interpretation or Foucauldian thing. Um, as you're, as I was reading it, I was thinking about the, the who song that was covered by wasp. I think it's a better actual, um, cover a better version, the real me, you know, uh, can you see the real me? Um, can you, can you, um, you know, it depends on what we're, we're talking about. The real me in that song is kind of a weird guy, right? Uh, <laughs> so very culturally conditioned, I would say. Doesn't mean that everything is like totally culturally determined. Um, all right. So FF has a bunch of questions. I'm going to answer one of them because I like to answer, you know, one at a time rather than piling up every, all those by one single person. And I'm not going to give everything that he's looking for. To expand my Nietzsche repertoire, seven works to Kierkegaard, Dostoevsky, Sartre, and Tolstoy, could you objectively recommend the works I need to read by these authors? Like seven works max for each one. I'm not going to give you seven works. The, 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 this is not a like um, tally everything up thing for each author. I mean, if you want to read Nietzsche, I'll, and I'll just stick with Nietzsche, right? I mean, if you want to get an idea about who's important in existentialism, check out my existentialism playlist, you know, or my uh, many writings out there about it, or the videos that I've got about who are the existentialists, and, and that'll that'll probably get you squared away. But let's think about Nietzsche. So at a minimum, I would say if you want to understand Nietzsche well, you want to read The Birth of Tragedy. Um, that's an early work. Nietzsche himself will criticize it, but it's still very important, and it articulates some, some key things. Um, you want to read Thus Spoke Zarathustra, in part because that was part of what built his reputation, and he references Zarathustra. You want to read The Genealogy of Morals, because that is the more systematic presentation of his later ideas. And I would say, um, you know, you could pick and choose whatever else you want to read. I think Beyond Good and Evil is a good place to go, right? So, yeah, that'll work. Um, Ozymandias, is it possible to make truth or value claims within an existentialist epistemological framework without the claim being reduced to pure personal preference? Yes, because there's many forms of existentialism, and there is no such thing as an existentialist epistemological framework. I don't know where you're getting that from, but um, the existentialists were not really working in those terms. Um, maybe you got that from some somebody else's uh, summary of existentialism. But there is like a, a an existentialist, here's our checklist about what it means to belong to the movement. It's a pretty wide, diverse movement. And it's not like existentialists think that everything is totally reduced to personal preference. Um, not even, not even Sartre, you know? So 
things do hold together. They just don't have some absolute, you know, overarching prefigured meaning that you can rely upon. But you want to figure out whether when you're talking about existentialism, you want to figure out who do you actually have in mind? Are you talking about Sartre? Are you talking about Camus? Are you talking about de Beauvoir? Just three figures that are already close together. Are you talking about Gabriel Marcel, another French existentialist who is in many respects um, quite different than them? First guy to use the word existentialist in French, by the way. Are you talking about uh, Nietzsche? Are you talking about some literary figures like Kafka or Rilke? Are you talking about Lev Shestov? Are you talking about Unamuno? You know, you gotta, you've got to clarify. There is no existentialist per se. That's part of, you know, the meaning of the, the movement, isn't it? Um, J.D. Sword, good to see you here. Uh, what kind of attitude should we hold towards the future? With COVID and climate change, it seems increasingly hard to be positive. Is a defeatist attitude reasonable? I mean, that's that's really up to you. Um, you don't have to satisfy the demands of universal human reason in order to have the standpoint that, that you have. I mean, it's, it's commendable that you want there to be some reasonability to your affective life, but it's not like that is some sort of imperative that we all should be either positive or negative or somewhere in between. And that, you know, only one of those is, is rational. It depends very much on where you sit and what you value. So, you know, if you, think that um, it, it really sucks that the environment is being degraded at a rapid rate and that our political gridlock and the fact that our, um, you know, capacities to change things are very limited by the uh, sorry crop of politicians that we've got who are like totally worthless on the Republican end and halfway worthless on the Democrat end and that corporations um, and, you know, other just rich people have, have a ton of influence over them. That sucks. But then the question is, well, does that mean that I have to think everything is crap? Um, no, I mean, that, that is in many respects up to you. Um, things can have value. Things can be good, even if they are going to be finite and have an end. Even if like, you know, nuclear war happened tomorrow, if I do something good for my wife or some homeless guy on the street or, you know, in this this discussion here, that good was real and it existed. And you can choose to focus on that or you can choose to focus on the it's all going to crap kind of thing, which hopefully is not the case. Maybe, maybe something will happen uh, and we'll, we'll get out of this. Um, and it's understandable, I will say this, that it does feel harder to be positive. COVID, um, you know, COVID-19 uh, and our screwed up response to it, um, largely driven by uh, crazy conspiracy stuff and uh, people profiting off of that. And then the complete, um, you know, es essentially intellectual breakdown of, of the, the right and the Republican Party here in the United States into opportunistic loons, um, which really hampered our COVID response, um, that can be dismaying. You know, the fact that we can we can get sick and die because um, we couldn't, we, the, the society, couldn't get its act together and, and ensure some basic health and hygiene stuff, um, that can be demoralizing, but it doesn't, it doesn't have to, you um, it doesn't have to be as demoralizing as I think a lot of people make it who are looking for big term solutions. COVID really revealed to us just how screwed up many of us knew things to be already because it laid additional stresses on our, our systems. So I think that's probably all that I have to say about that. Um, Made of Clay has some very general questions that are kind of tough to answer. Is there more philosophy in English departments than in philosophy departments? And what are some things you don't like about the philosophy departments today? I mean, so one of the things that I do have to say is there is an incredible vast diversity in American higher education. So it's not like there is an archetype of philosophy department that you can point at because it's different from place to place. And indeed, some of the places where I teach or have taught don't even have philosophy departments, but have philosophy classes. 
Um, for example, when I was at Fayetteville State University, we had a philosophy minor and we taught a lot of critical thinking classes, but we did not have a philosophy program. We were under the Department of Government and History. Milwaukee Area Technical College obviously does not have a philosophy program. They only have three philosophy classes and one they added <laughs> recently. Um, Milwaukee Institute of Art and Design does not have a philosophy program. I am, I am the philosophy guy there. They brought me in to kind of add some of that to the curriculum. And Carthage College just recently got rid of their philosophy department, which was very small, um, just, just two guys. <clears throat> and then, you know, some adjuncts like myself. And um, they, they did that essentially to like trim personnel. Um, they still have philosophy classes. I'm teaching medieval philosophy there next semester, and I'm teaching business ethics this semester. So just at like those institutions, we can say there's a wide diversity between how philosophy is done. Is it done more in English departments? I wouldn't say so. I would say some authors get taught more in English departments, but they often get taught not in the mode of doing philosophy, but rather, you know, focusing on their literary stuff. So you probably do have more Mary Wollstonecraft being taught in English departments than philosophy departments. Um, but they're probably not just focusing on vindication of the rights of women or the vindication of the rights of man, but also on her letters from Scandinavia, um, her various novels and, you know, letters and things like that. So, you know, um, are there things I don't like about the way philosophy is done here in the United States kind of generally? Yeah, I, and I've talked about some of that. I think that intro classes, ethics classes, these things that we call service classes are, you know, very important and often get treated as if they are the slums and we're wasting our time with these non-major students when really those, those should be the most important classes and everybody should have to teach them and everybody should be evaluated on how they teach them. So if you're, you know, some big shot, um, only teaches graduate classes, professor, maybe you should get reined in because you can't effectively teach undergrads well. Somebody, by the way, who did do very good teaching for undergraduates and chose to do so, Alistair McIntyre at Notre Dame, when he could have like said, I'm only doing graduate students from now on. He said, I'm teaching undergrads. So, yeah. Um, let's see here. Abu says, greetings, professor. Extremely grateful for your contribution to my intellectual growth. Oh, I'm glad glad to read that. Yeah, and, and um, I think it's important to, to think about this as, you know, the most that we can do, like with YouTube videos or stuff like that, is offer you resources, which then it's up to you to do something with, right? To, to read the books, to think about it, to go through the growth. We can offer you some, some useful, you know, structure and resources and, and an attaboy every once in a while. But um, it's really, you know, it's really what you do with it that that, that counts. Um, let's see here. Shafia, I'm a kid. I have this question no one's answering for me. Um, that's That sounds like, you know, uh, what happens a lot in school. Is the brain controlling us or are we controlling it? And the answer is yes, both. I mean, our brain is not different from us. It, it's significant locus of the us that's us or the me that's me, right? Take my brain out. I don't know that there's, I mean, there's a lot of medical waste left because I'm dead, <laughs> but um, I don't know that there's an awful lot left. I mean, you can say that we have an extended mind in many respects, you know, in, in a certain way. So I've got my, my book sitting here, right? Um, this is sort of an extension of a me at one time and other, other people's brains as well, because I, I translated their works. Um, but, you know, it's still mostly in the wetware up in our, our skulls. And what's cool about the brain is that it is a reflexive organ, right? So the brain can think about the brain. The brain can picture the brain. The brain is already in the process of modifying the brain. And so who controls what? You know, there's a bit of self-control there, isn't there? Um, all right. Uh, John. Uh, not philosophy related, but any advice for someone who's going to be teaching for the first time at a high school? 
Um, no advice, but some, uh, uh, you know, what would you call it? I'll just say more power to you. Um, you know, somebody has got to do that with, with those kids. It's not something that I could do myself. Um, so for those who can do it, thank God that they are, because otherwise we would have just a whole generation of little, uh, not even barbarians, uh, roaming around, right? We, every, every generation, we have to teach it all again to these students, which includes not just teaching the information, but even teaching like how to acquire the information. And there's so much that we have to impart to kids. And you can see the effects of not doing that. Um, in so many people. So that's great that you're going to be teaching high school, but I don't, I don't actually have an awful lot to, um, to do. I'm going to remind people because I see somebody like, you know, asking questions over and over and over again, ask once. Um, you're not going to get much more by, by um, posting it more than once. You're basically wasting everybody else's time and space by doing that. So all right. Uh, what do we got next? Um, John Holloway, in some of your lectures on Epictetus' discourses, you start in book two and jump around. Do you think there's certain books chapter that should be read first or should it be read linearly? It should be read over and over and over again. That's the answer to your question. It doesn't matter whether you read it linearly or whether you read it jumping around, but you should be reading it like any philosophical text many, many times. Um, and as you do that, you will come to realize that Epictetus's discourses, which he did not write, but were written by his his uh, pupil Arius or Arian, um, were not arranged in a sort of systematic order. Um, so it doesn't matter if you start with chapter one, you know, from book one, or whether you start in book four. Um, and I don't jump around. I'm I, I've been reading Epictetus long enough, like, you know, by the time I shot those videos, 25 years, to be able to know what sections are relevant to other sections. Just like if you're doing Thomas Aquinas and you go to the Summa Theologia, Thomas never tells you everything that there is to know in any particular question and article that's titled, you know, about anger or something like that. There's going to be all sorts of other things scattered throughout his work that are relevant. And the better that you get to understand an author, the more you do what appears to you skipping around, which is really correlating all the different connected discussions. Um, so, I mean, the answer to, to how you should read it is read it often and read it over and over again. And these sort of questions about do you have to read it, you know, sequentially, moot point, you know, if you do that. Um Cognitive psychology, PhD, what's your thoughts on the closest theory to the objective truth overall? I don't know what objective truth is supposed to mean. There's so many things that objective means. It's called kind of an ambiguous term, so uh, there's no answer for that one. Um, okay, so a bunch of uh, questions here by Agor uh, about fourth political theory, Alexander Dugan. You got to actually frame your, your question as a question. Please explain it. I don't, I'm not a Dugan person, so no idea why you're, you know, looking for answers about that. Why not read Dugan yourself, right? Or, or find somebody who's, who's particularly interested in him. James says, how much of Nietzsche's hatred of Christianity was of Christianity proper? And how much was his hatred of Plato and seeing Christianity as Platonism for the masses? I would say neither um, is, it's not like he, as, as a kid, the, you know, son of a, a, uh, you know, Lutheran, uh, who, by the way, as a kid to show the other kids that the saints could probably, you know, have the sort of wills that they did, held a, a hot piece of metal in his hand. Um, Nietzsche's relationship with Christianity is complex. It's not just this, just that. Um, the whole, you know, Christianity is Platonism for the masses is, on the one hand, kind of a, a cool throwaway quote, um, that doesn't really tell you that much unless you understand what Platonism is supposed to mean um, and how Christianity is supposed to correlate with it. And on the other hand, if you dig into it and you do that, then you can, oh, now, now I see what Nietzsche is really after here. Um, I think you can say he did have a hatred for Christianity, but he also, I mean, again, read The Birth Tragedy. 
And you'll see that his attitude towards Christianity is quite complex. There's Christianity as a doctrine. There's Christianity as a church. There's Christianity as centered around the figure of Christ. And he has different attitudes towards each of these and different attitudes from book to book. So, yeah. All right. Um, Andrew says, do you have a recommended reading list when starting off reading philosophy? If so, where could I find it? I mean, I do for beginners, but it's, you know, in a, in any sort of reading list, um, when it comes to that, you should always take with a grain of salt, right? I have a uh, uh, 10 books that I recommend to beginner. You could probably just put that in Google, you know, 10 books, Sadler, and a Medium article will pop up. And that came out of a conversation that I had with my uh, friend and colleague, uh, Leia on her common sense ethics blog. Um, and then I turned it into to a medium piece. And uh, interestingly enough, it is by far the most read medium piece that I have at this point in time. I think there's like, you know, tens of thousands of people have read it. Um, so if you just Google um, Sadler, 10 books, beginners, it'll, it'll come up right off the, the bat. Uh, Mark says, how's it going? Hope you're keeping well. Yeah, pretty good here. Um, we, you know, we've had a couple of interesting things happen locally. If anybody has been following it, our, uh, star quarterback, Aaron Rodgers, uh, for the Green Bay Packers has tested positive for COVID. And it turned out that he lied about whether he was actually vaccinated against it. And then when offered the opportunity to explain himself, went off into conspiracy rant land using all of like the code words, you know, woke cancel culture. And so he's, he's just, he came out as a nutter. Um, very, very disappointing and a terrible lack of leadership and responsibility on his part. He may have sunk his boat, you know? Um, so that's kind of a big story around here. There's also been an interesting development on Twitter where, I don't know who the hell was organizing this, but they did a brackets thing for American cities and people would vote about, you know, which city is better than which city and Milwaukee's in there. And Milwaukee recently uh, made it to the semifinals and then beat Chicago, which, which makes sense because even though Chicago has more people as a city, there's a lot of things that suck about Chicago that don't suck about Milwaukee. Um, I, and I can speak as somebody who knows both of them very, very well. You know, I've got a lot of family in the Chicago area. I've lived in the Chicagoland area and I, I now live here in Milwaukee. And apparently Milwaukee also just beat New York. <laughs> so, so that's kind of a cool thing, too. Um, other other stuff, you know, we we went last night, my wife and I, to see this uh, big cats uh, thing at the Bradley Center which was originally scheduled for my, my birthday last year, but due to COVID, um, it got it got put off, and, and so we get, we finally went to the event, and that was kind of cool. It was this guy, National Geographic photographer, showing pictures and clips and talking about you know photographing all these big cats, and then some of the, the big problems that are that are faced by them as well. So that's that's how's it going. And the other thing is, my students are like. Thanksgiving break cannot come soon enough for those poor kids or for me. <laughs> so that's what's going on. Um, let's see here. God says, have you read anything of Kazajakis? Don't even know who that refers to. So no. Uh, Gassia Eagle, greetings from Poland. First time in here. Well, welcome to it. Uh, FF, thanks for all. How are your humor? In terms of laugh, smile, and comedy, the stuff that makes you laugh. Oh, you know, I like to, I, I there's a lot of good stuff out there, uh, either in like the various streaming platforms like Hulu or Netflix or Amazon Prime or HBO Max. And I've always got like some funny show. I've been watching Swedish Dicks lately, which is very, very funny. Uh, that's on That's on Amazon Prime. And I've also been watching Lower Decks. I don't know if any of you have been watching that, but that's that's pretty good too. I, I enjoy that. Um, 
you know, and there's also, I, we like what I like watching. I can't speak for my, my wife. I think she'll humor me on this. Um, you know, British comedy shows, especially Scott's ones for some reason, a lot of funny stuff. And oftentimes you can find things on YouTube, right? So I, you know, I like to watch, um, shows, uh, and, and laugh a bit about that. There's enough other stuff we can laugh about. I mean, one of the, going back to, um, um, Gerald uh, Swords thing about like, you know, the really crappy environment that we do live in. Um, what should our response be to it? Sometimes it's okay to laugh, you know, um, and it can be a bitter laugh or it can be a sardonic laugh or it can be a sarcastic laugh, but there's something about laughing that um, is better than crying as Seneca points out, you know? Um, all right. Uh, M.A., are you familiar with René Girard or mimetic theory? I am indeed. <laughs> Jesse, what do you think of Badiou? Just started reading Being an Event, and it seems cool. Um, I, I'm just not into Badiou. He's, he's somebody who I know a little bit about, but not much about. Um, I will say that my wife has studied with him and actually acted in his play and, and, and received the great accolade that she was the most Ahmed of Ahmeds. Um, so, you know, he seems like a cool guy, but, you know, who's got the time to read everybody, you know? Um, so not really, I don't really have much to say about him. Uh, Yin Yin, when can we hope for some Schopenhauer? Well, definitely when the semester's over, because this semester, if you haven't noticed, I have been producing a lot of videos on Ursula K. Le Guin's Earthsea uh, six-book series, and so that has occupied a great amount of my time. Trying to do that and, you know, events like this and the Half Hour Hegel series and stuff like that has more or less tapped me out. So I would say in the new year, um, unless something radically changes. Uh, Vincent Andrew, your thoughts on Bergson, Merleau-Ponty, and Jung. Uh, that's kind of a weird mix to put together there. Um, Bergson, underrated philosopher. I very much enjoy reading him. Um, I think that he's he's uh, well worth checking out and going back to. Uh, Merle Ponty also kind of, you know was a big deal in his time. Um, not that read these days, well worth reading. Um, Phenomenology Perception is the big work, of course, but he's got a lot of other good stuff as well. And Jung, um, I'm not a fan of Jung. Um, I, I, you know, I've read quite a bit. I don't buy the archetype stuff. And, and I think that a lot of the people who talk about Jung, very often the fact that they, you know, like get so worked up about archetypes or the shadow or stuff like that, um, it's a sign to me that it's not, it's not really worth my time to engage in conversation. They can do that on their own. I do like what Jung has to say about other people quite often, and that's what I consider to be some of the best parts of his works. He's often kind of insightful and witty, so, but I, I'm not a Jungian in any respect. So, All right, awful philosophy. Evening, do you have any advice how to get into phenomenology? Husserl's just so in inaccessibly dry. Yeah, um, it's kind of, that's kind of an interesting thing to, 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 start with. So yeah, Husserl is boring. The Husserl is very dry. It's like reading Jeremy Bentham. It, it, it's worth doing, right? But Husserl was a boring phenomenologist. And Husserl scholars, they're kind of a weird little clique of their own. And you can there's like a shtick that goes with them. I've known quite a few over the years. And as a matter of fact, I did my master's thesis under one of them. I did my master's thesis on Husserl on his passive synthesis lectures. Um, that said, if you are going to read Husserl, Husserl himself has an Encyclopedia Britannica article on phenomenology. And when I when I used to teach Husserl, you know, like in a continental philosophy class, I would use that and his Cartesian meditations, um, which are pretty accessible. There's a lot of terminology stuff, but you know, you can see what he's doing. Um, there's a lot of other really great phenomenologists that are contemporaries of Husserl. I mean, Britano is, is well worth checking out. Um, Mark Shaler, brilliant phenomenologist, very interesting to read, um, a lot of fun and just as important as Husserl. Um, 
Heidegger, of course, you know, John Paul Sartre is a phenomenologist. Um, Gabriel Marcel is a phenomenologist. Edith Stein, you know, there's lots and lots of other people that you can read from that early period. By the way, Alistair McIntyre has a biography of Edith Stein who, uh, in which he sort of like lays out what the intellectual field was like at the time. So I would, I would actually check that out. Um, so, you know, that's early phenomenology. And I think once you get your feet wet in that, you can find all sorts of other co cool people who are doing interesting stuff. Some of whom you probably have never heard of. Like, you know, if you're interested in phenomenology and uh, philosophy of religion, Jean Ehring is, you know, H E R H E R I N G would be like one of the people that you, you go to, but nobody reads them anymore. Right. I, I'm not even sure if his stuff has been translated, but um, yeah, there's, there's a lot of cool people in phenomenology. And then there's like people still doing it in the present and you can go online, just, you know, Google like phenomenology society. You're going to find websites of people dedicated to doing it in the present. And so um, connecting up with them can be kind of fun. Right. Dator says, what are your thoughts of Ted Kaczynski and his critique of society and technology? So I, I have to say, I don't know it that well. I've never read his manifesto. Um, it's something I've actually wanted to do for a while, but just, you know, haven't found the time to because, you know, I, I, I read things that other people have written and they're like, yeah, there's, there's, you know, this isn't just ravings. There's something here. And I'm like, well, I should probably check it out, but I, I don't have an, enough uh, to say about it. So uh Let's see here. It just skipped a little bit. Vincent, is every psychoanalysis theory could be considered as philosophy? Probably not. Um, I mean, you could say that every, and, and let's expand it beyond psychoanalysis, psychological and psychotherapeutic. Could every theory be considered as philosophy? It can be considered to have philosophical assumptions or underpinnings like anything else. I mean, if you're doing sociology, um, or any of these other fields that that spun out of philosophy, you are doing some philosophy, but probably without realizing it, you know. Uh, same thing with economics, same thing with pick whatever you want. Um, but there, there's some that are probably much more philosophically informed than, than others, you could say. I mean, classic psychoanalysis, those people all knew quite a bit of philosophy because they had gone through a university system that had you reading that early on and and uh it was part of general culture um would american psychoanalysts of the you know 1990s through the 2020s know much philosophy it really depends on the psychoanalyst probably a lot of them don't know much at all unless they're you know into somebody who's who's uh, quite interested in in philosophy so all right um Let's see here. Gas, yeah, Eagle. Are we a piece of meat? Yeah. No, you're not just a piece of meat. You're a whole bunch of pieces of meat. You got your organs. You got, you know, uh, all the different cuts that you could make, all the different muscle groups. So, uh, yeah, you're, you're, uh, uh, there's a lot of meat to a person. All right. Uh, Thomas says, nice dude sweater. Yeah, my wife got this for me years and years ago because people, when I first started uh, teaching and I was, uh, you know, on YouTube, I'd been teaching for 10 years at that time. I had my hair down a lot. And, and I guess the way that I look and the way that I talk reminded quite a few people of the dude. So she thought it would be kind of funny to get me the, the sweater, which is very nice. I, you know, it's cold here and I, I wear it a lot in the winter. Um, I might do some videos someday when I have the time as the dude. We'll see about that. All right. Uh, Punit says, I feel so sleepy whenever I start. You read a book. Uh, to read a book, I'm assuming, right? Coffee helps with that. Um, maybe sitting up. I don't know. You know, fresh air, that sort of thing. Uh, Kassian, I really appreciate your videos. I was wondering whether you've done a video detailing your current philosophical views on a related note. Have you done the Phil paper survey? I've looked at the Phil paper survey. Those of you who don't know what we're referencing here. So there's, there's Phil papers is a, a website 
and they do a survey every once in a while, a really crappy survey in my view because of the way it's constructed. It's very off on, you know, one way or the other. And it asks about a lot of the isms that people are into in contemporary analytic philosophy, and it doesn't ask about much of anything else. And I, I, I view it as a waste of time. It's not, it's not representative. It's poorly constructed, but, you know, there you have it, you know. Um, my own views, my own philosophical views, I, I mean, I did a piece, a thing in my philosophical developments about eclecticism. I am a Ciceronian eclectic, you know. That means that I draw on, you know, a number of other people and, you know, a little bit of this here, a lot of this here, try to put them together. There's a constant effort to try to overcome contradictions uh, and figure out what sources are best. You could call this pluralism if you're more of a Will William James kind of person. There's a lot of names for it, but um, I, I am not a... Um, particularly one single way committed kind of kind of person. And, you know, a lot of the people who I like from history aren't that way too. So, um, E. Demont, if you had to choose which main philosophers the average person should acquaint themselves with, who would it be and why? Uh, I mean, that's, I, I mentioned that piece that I wrote, like, 10 philosophical books that beginners could start with e easy enough to Google, or you can find it on my, my medium site. Um, and you know, that was picking a top 10 is kind of tough. There's this tendency to like, always say, Oh yeah, but also this person, this person, and this person. Right. Um, I mean, you definitely want to know ancient philosophy. So you should, you should read Plato and, um, do you have to read everything Plato wrote? No, I don't think so. Uh, you know, and some Aristotle and, you know, the Stoics, what we have of them at the Epicureans, the little that we have of them. Um, it's good to read, you know, uh, some of the skeptic stuff like Sexus Empiricus. You wouldn't have to read everything the guy wrote, obviously. Um, Cicero is great. I think, um, I'm a big fan of, of Plutarch and Alexander of Aphrodisius and a lot of these early uh, Christian thinkers as well, um, and some of the later Neoplatonists. Um, and that's, that's just ancient philosophy, right? And, you know, you could go on and, like, everybody probably should read Descartes, and, and not just in a half-assed way, like, you know, just trying to get through the book to get through it. Everybody probably should read Descartes' meditations at one point in their their life and really read it and everybody probably should read the first two books of Hobbes Leviathan not not the weird wacky crazy theology that only Hobbes buys into in part three and part four um, and there's other texts along the way as well but it's, it's tough to say what they what they should be right because every time we do that the, like the list just gets monumental <laughs> um, so yeah all right, uh, let's see here. Ha ha hi says, if you had to choose between reading only metaphysics, epistemology, or ethics for the rest of your life, which would you choose? I mean, you don't have to because some books are all three, right? Um, and those those all blend into each other. I mean, you you know, ethics is inevitably going to lead into both metaphysics and and epistemology and epistemology already raises ethical questions and stuff like that. So I don't, I don't think that I, I, I would be able to answer that well. Um, let's see. Shafia says, sorry to ask again, how can I be a good thinker and writer? Suggest some books that will help me. Please reply. I mean, you want to be a good writer, read other good writers, spend a lot of time reading other good writers. You want to be a good thinker, see what those writers have to say and, you know, question them along the way and learn from them. And, um, this is the same advice that so many other people give. I'll add one other thing from Ursula K. Le Guin. You want to be a good writer, write, 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 write. You have to keep writing and you have to do a lot of crappy writing before you're going to become good. Are there books to help with this? I mean, the books that you're going to be reading, you know, so um, read good literature. 
Um, read, read good essayists writing about good literature. Ursula K. Le Guin would be one of them, right? Um, but there's so many others as well. Read, read Virginia Woolf. Read uh, uh, what um, uh, people like Lewis and Chesterton have to say, not just in their, their uh, own stuff, but about other thinkers. Read Graham Greene's film reviews. Uh, for some really crazy stuff, stuff that almost got him beaten up by by people who had produced the films. Um, the way that you get good at it, there isn't like a book out there, How to Become a Good Thinker, How to Become a Good Writer. It's engaging in, in that field. Uh, Michael James, who is your favorite philosopher from the high Middle Ages other than Aquinas? For me, things start to get strange in Scotus and Occam. Well, it depends on where we count the high Middle Ages as starting. If we push it back far enough, obviously Anselm, because he's the guy I've written the most about and have a particular attachment to. I'm, I'm less into these scholastic writers and more into the monastic writers, you know. Um, so uh, Andrew has a good question here. When you're going through a difficult and stressful time, what philosophy do you find yourself turning to? How do you apply that philosophy in the moment? I mean, this is where eclecticism becomes very helpful. If you're not just like a, I'm a stoic and that's how I do everything, or I'm a this or I'm a that, you have a much wider repertoire to draw upon. And there's no one single answer to how do you apply it? You know, it, that's where prudence comes in, figuring out what to what to use in, in what situations. Um, <clears throat> I draw very heavily on Stoicism, on the Aristotelian tradition, on <clears throat> some, you know, um, Platonism, less from Plato, much more from the you know middle and late Platonists, um, from existentialist authors, from dialectical authors, from some phenomenologists. Mark Shaler is a great example. I remember when I was I was going through a particularly bad breakup, and as as you do when you have a terrible breakup, you feel like you know the world is over and you'll never love again and all that sort of stuff. And I remember I was on Southern Illinois campus. And I was riding my bike back home to uh, my trailer on the south side of town. And I was feeling so, so blue, you know. And then I started thinking about what Mock Shaler might have to say about the situation that I was in. And as I was riding, I realized that while I was still feeling really down, a part of me was no longer down because it was like thinking through this, this thing as almost like a a problem, not a problem to be solved, but a problem, something thrown in front of you as a problem means to, to think about and scrutinize and see through this, this lens. And I realized that my spirits had picked up uh, by doing that. I hadn't become like happy or something, but I didn't feel as, as crappy. Now, it, that's an application, but is that something that you can say, well, okay, so when I'm in a situation, I need to, to think about a mock Shaler idea and what he would say about it. It doesn't work quite that way. It's, it's, instead, you stock your mind up. This is why the Stoics, by the way, over and over again in their works, like Epictetus and Seneca will say, you know, remind yourself of this or consider this or when in a situation tell yourself this, right? And they're, they're telling you to stock up your mind with useful stuff that you won't know how useful it is until you get into a situation. So, all right, uh, Thomas, uh, what comedians do you think are funny? It seems like comedians can get away with saying things a lot of people can't because they're just funny and poking around. Uh, I mean, it depends on the, the comedian, right? Um, Again, it's it, for me. It's like less individual comedians and more shows that that I enjoy watching. Um, so, you know, there are some really great like comedy teams, like the guys, for example, who did uh, Bonus Town, um, or Scott's show a while back, or uh, Chewing the Fat, an older show. Turns out there's connections sometimes between them. Um, you know, another another Brit show that we we particularly enjoyed was, uh, and I I was not expecting to enjoy it. Um, actually, there's two that that have have uh, one one guy in common, another Greg, um, Cuckoo and uh, um, 
Oh, now I'm blanking on her name. I can see the the lead actress, uh, Royzen Kennedy, in it. Um, Game Face, you know. And then you know we, we'll we'll watch like Saturday Night Live, and sometimes it's good, sometimes it sucks. Some of the people on it are very funny. <laughs> some of them are. Some of them are, are not, um, you know, so I, I don't have like a, a repertoire of, of particular comedians I'm like super into. Um, all right. Uh, Colors of gaming. I'm just now dabbling in philosophy, stoicism. I'm curious how someone can be both passionate for change in your surroundings, politics or culture while still being stoic. Well, you got to understand stoicism well, so you want to, do a lot of work to actually do that. It, it's not something that you can like get a few quotes from and then start applying. Um, that's fake stoicism. Um, the Stoics have an entire theory of emotions. Best book on that, Margaret Graver's Stoicism and Emotion, but there's plenty of, of resources out there. And you can find the emotions discussed in Seneca and in uh, at different points in Epictetus and Marcus Aurelius and then in, you know, Arius Didymus and and uh, um, Diogenes Laertes' summaries of Stoic doctrine. The Stoics didn't think that you couldn't have emotions about things. You just, they had to be within the scope of, of reason, human rationality. So, you know, you can, you can be committed about a cause and be, you know, doing so as a Stoic. I mean, Stoics fought in the Civil War. Cato <laughs> was dead sent against... Uh, Caesar, right? Even though Pompey was kind of a scumbag too, um, Cicero and Cato both, both you know, lined up against them to the detriment of Cato's life and eventually uh, in a different way of, of Cicero's life. Um, so it's perfectly possible to be committed to social change and be a Stoic. Um, you just want to go further into the literature to see how, that, how that's the case. Um Inshrek, what do you think about the mistranslation of the word Aufhebung to abolition in the Communist Manifesto and how it created a huge misunderstanding of Marxism? I don't know that it created a huge you know, misunderstanding of Marxism. So, you know, I that's that's not it's not something I can really comment on. Um, abolition is not really a good translation of Aufhebung if it's meant in a Hegelian way, because um, Hegelian Aufhebung does involve like transcending something or going past something um, and, and perhaps also leaving something of what's being transcended behind, but it also means incorporating as well. So just abolishing something isn't the same thing. Although Hegel himself will sometimes use Aufheben or Aufhebung in, in ways that are different from this as well. Um, you know, where it could mean something just like canceled out or, um, superseded is often uh, like Miller likes that sometimes. So, yeah. Bruce has some good advice about Dugan scholars here. Glad to see Bruce here. Um, and, uh, oh, here's a really interesting question by Roughly Bumble. Is there a 20th century figure you believe most, you exemplified most of the classical virtues? So, and let, let's talk, let's think in terms of, just to make it simple, the classical virtues, let's use the cardinal virtues. Let's not go into Aristotle's kind of extended list. Um, so wisdom, justice, temperance, and courage. And I would say, yeah, I mean, I, I mentioned Alistair McIntyre in here. I've interacted with the guy. I'd say he's got the virtues. He is a virtue ethicist who talks the talk and walks the walk. Um, my interactions with uh, Christopher Gill and Julia Annas lead me to believe. Now, they're, you know, obviously all three of these people are also 21st century figures because they've managed to survive <laughs> into the 21st century. Uh, McIntyre is 93, if I, if I remember right. Uh, Gill and Annas are fortunately, you know, considerably younger, but are, are definitely getting up there, but did a lot of work prior to the 21st century. Um, and I would say they, they seem to be people who have the virtues as well. Um, I mean, who else should we think about biographically? Um, that's a good question. Did Gabriel Marcel exemplify the, the virtues? A lot of the time, some of the time he could be kind of a, a 
you know, prickly jerk. <laughs> Um, you know, you, you look at his, his criticisms, like, so Mar Marcel was a Christian existentialist, um, Beauvoir, Sartre and Camus, who later fell out with each other, Sartre and Beauvoir together with, against Camus, they were, um, all atheistic existentialists and they would often say bad stuff about each other. And I, and I kind of think that, like Camus' uh, response to Marcel's criticisms of his plays, I think are actually on point. Um, but Marcel was a good guy in, in general. Um, I mean, who else? I'm sure there were lots and lots of people. It's difficult to say sometimes, right? Because we we don't know these people that well. Um, and we were dependent either on biographers or on personal acquaintance with them. So... Uh, Michael says, as a Packers fan, I'm very disappointed with Aaron Rodgers. I am too. You know, I, I, I've often stood up for him uh, because there's a lot of haters out there. I think that in the past, he did, in fact, make a lot of good points and uh, decisions about stuff in terms of the management of the team. It's interesting that you notice that he would kind of fence it when it came to important uh, issues, um, for example, having to do with Kaepernick and the kneeling thing, right? Um, and maybe now we look back at Rodgers and we're like, maybe he, he was actually, you know, somebody who, who uh, harbored these ideas back then about woke crowds and canceling and stuff like that. Or maybe it's just adventitious and he's, and he's crazy for COVID, you know? Um, I don't know. But, but the recent stuff, and his justification of it, it's tough to come back from that, you know. Um, and I think it's going to affect the team. Um, so, yeah. Isaac, do you have a particular Stoic text you enjoy teaching more than any other? That's a good, that's a great question. Um, yeah, so I don't, I don't teach all of them, right? Uh, when I'm teaching Stoicism, it's usually drawing mostly from uh, Epictetus or Seneca or even Cicero. I, I don't usually teach Marcus Aurelius in part because the, the meditations are so disjointed. It's jumping around. I mean, you want to talk about a work that, that is unsystematic. Um, you know, the, 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 the different books other than book one, the gratitude journal, um, there's no like one single common theme running through them. Whereas, at least with Seneca, you've got to work like, you know, um, on the happy life. Well, you could expect that it's going to be mostly about the happy life, right? Or a letter of consolation or, you know, with Epictetus, there's like chapter headings. Um, I, I like Epictetus more than the others. I have to say he's always been my favorite. So I guess maybe I like teaching him the best. He's also kind of raw and salty like me. He's not afraid to like, call people out and say, well, that's a dumb question. Or, you know, I, I don't like say slave, you know, or stuff like that, but I kind of like that. I like being a, a straight, you know, straight shooter with people about stuff. So, uh, Zeno says, how do you feel about changing philosophies? Are you concerned with consistency or is it okay to change religions, philosophy? I don't see why consistency it precludes changing philosophies. If you're consistent and you think you, you come to have better information and you realize that something that you bought into in the past um, turned out to be, you know, lacking or inadequate in, in certain respects, then consistency would actually have you follow through and say, I'm going to leave this behind, or at least I have to attenuate my, my commitment to this. Um, so I, I don't know that they're really, um, I, I don't know that they're really uh, incompatible that way. As a matter of fact, genuine consistency might require you when you find out that something, you know. Okay, so let's use this 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 uh, Aaron Rodgers thing, right? Uh, so in the past, I've I've said that Rodgers was a good leader. He made good decisions. Here's the reasons why. You know, now he's he's done some you know really dumb stuff uh, in. Just, you know, in the last week, he did more to undermine himself than he's done to build himself up over the last 17 years. 
And could we, you know, if I'm being consistent, does that mean that I say, oh, no, 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 it's, this is not that bad. You know, let's make believe that it's all okay. There must be an explanation somewhere. Or does consistency require me to say, well, I had some criteria for what good leadership looked like before. I should keep on applying those criteria. And this guy, unfortunately, has like seemingly flipped 180 degrees. Um, so it depends on what you mean by consistency, I, I, I would say, you know. Um, all right, let's see. Scroll down. Oops, just skipped a bit. Um, e. Demon says, I know we have only certain philosophical works from the past, but are there any other, any names mentioned in the books of works we wish we had? Do you think it's possible that there are great works in a cave? I mean, anything's possible in the sense of like sheer possibility, as David Hume has said. And if you can imagine it, it's possible, right? In a very abstract sense. Um, you know, the, the best prospects for getting new texts are those um, manuscripts, the scrolls from Herculaneum that they're slowly working their way through. We might find some some new stuff. Um, are there works that we wish we had? I actually did a video on that years and years ago, philosophical texts that we know existed, um, but we don't have them, you know? Uh, would it be would it be nice to have them? Yeah, um, but what are we gonna do? All right. Uh, Masia says, "Why did Nietzsche end up crazy?" Uh, we don't know. Could be something organic. You know, people put around the theory that it was syphilis. We don't know. Um, could have been um, that there were some you know, lurking psychological things going on that, that he just hadn't worked through and that broke him down. Um, I mean, he came from a pretty goofy family. Just look at his sister. Um, we don't, we don't, I mean, anybody who tells you that they know for sure exactly why Nietzsche went nuts is, is uh, either lying to you or full of crap or trying to sell you something. Um, there's a lot of, there's a lot of places in, in history where we have to say, eh, we got some guesses, but that's as good as it gets, you know, uh, Diogenes, any works of Bataille that you like in particular? Uh, yeah, the erotic is, is, is pretty cool. I haven't looked at it for a long time, but, um, that I remember really enjoying that. Armin, the one or the many, I don't know. Are, are, are we just one? <laughs> Uh, or are you something different for me asking that question? Uh, Ed Keeley, any new books on technology uh, that I would recommend? I'm, I'm not like an expert on, on uh, technology, so no, I don't have any recommendations. Luca, how should I understand the interplay between force and law in Hegel's phenomenology? Chapter three, it's not chapter three, it's the force and the understanding section. Is it is that the understanding? Is it that the understanding fails because the specific laws don't express the necessity of force? That is a thing that happens. You're talking about a big long section in which there's a lot of dynamic development. Um, I'm not able to give you like a nice, easy thumbnail summary of that uh, off the top of my head here. I mean, I I don't know how many videos I took to go through that section of the the phenomenology. Um, all right. Uh, if I may ask, what are your general political views? I'm virtue ethicist. So I think that um, cultivating uh, good character is incredibly important and that has implications. So that makes me uh, you know, look at um, our current Republican Party as almost entirely corrupt and in many respects evil. The Democrats are not you know, great. As an independent, I'm going to throw my weight behind them probably the rest of my life because I don't see the I don't see the Republicans coming out of the morass that they are are in. Um, so there's a lot of there's a lot of things where I think that you know we should be able to come together as a community, and the people who are preventing that through their own greed or their need to uh, be able to criticize somebody else, you know. Uh, to to whine about cancel culture or critical race theory or other silly you know stuff that doesn't actually uh, impinge upon you know real 
life conditions, except at little tiny places. Um, you know, they're the ones holding us back from dealing with the great crises that as rational animals, we ought to be able to deal with climate change. We ought to be doing stuff on that. Um, we ought to have a much more equal society. You know, these massive inequalities of wealth, big problem, you know, um, American exceptionalism, just stupid at this point in time. I mean, there might've been a time way, way back where it was somewhat justified, but the stuff that we're doing today, just, just silly, you know? Um, so, you know, my, my politics wind up basically aligning much more with the left than the right. I mean, people who call themselves conservatives today, 99% of them are not conserving anything. They're just a bunch of hateful, uh, you know, people who want things to be different than they, they are, worse than they are, just so it can be better for them. And so they're not conservative because they're not saving. They're not standing up for anything. And, and it's really quite, quite terrible. Um, one of my favorite biblical verses, also one of Thomas Aquinas's most favorite biblical verses, comes from Isaiah. Woe to those who call good evil and evil good, who call light darkness, darkness light, who call sweet bitter and bitter sweet. So, you know, um, wh who are the ones that are doing that? You got to ask yourself that. And by the way, you know, in the past, I've been much more a critic of the left than I was of, of the right when it was warranted, you know, back in, say, the 1990s. Um, but now, you know, who are the ones holding things back? Who are the ones that are that are, you know, justifying much more evil uh, and uh, standing in the way of, of fixing things? Those are the questions you got to ask yourself. Um, I'm not even sure how to pronounce this. Erdrok Goda. I'm a student of geology. What Would you have advice, see pitfalls for those who, not being philosophers by training, wish to study the metaphysics of our disciplines? No, I strongly advise you to study the metaphysics and the history. That's even more important. The history of your discipline so you can understand how the concepts developed. Um, that's a great thing to do. Um, now, you know, uh, I wouldn't rely on Wikipedia for that or other um, very schematic sources, but I would I would read around a lot. Yeah, it'd be really great. Hmm. Floyd Mayweather asks, who are some of your favorite Nouvelle the theologians? Uh, so the Nouvelle Theologie or Ressourcement is, is a particular... Uh, time in in uh, uh, um, church history, you can say, in intellectual history, or a philosopher. Well, obviously, Maurice Blondel, right? Um, and, you know, I mean, I did my, my dissertation on the guy. Um, Henri de Lubeck, very influenced by Blondel, has a lot of cool stuff to say, and uh, I enjoy reading his stuff. Um, haven't been reading a lot of them. I mean, Yves Simone, I would say, kind of falls into that that category. Um, and I, I think he's got a great book on virtue, by the way. I'm, I'm kind of blanking on the name of it. Is it called The Concept of Virtue? Um, but it, it's really it's really quite good. So, yeah. Um, all right. Cantat says, are you familiar with Ferdinand Ulrich? If so, what are your thoughts on Homo Abyssus? I've, I've never heard of either. Uh, sounds like an interesting title. So, uh, Snowdrift Moon, can you say a nice happy birthday to the boys Tay and Coop over at Machinic Unconscious Happy Hour? So that's Cooper. I'm not sure who Tay is because I, I haven't been on it for, for a long time. But yeah, happy birthday. Uh, is, is it the podcast is having a, a birthday celebration? Uh, or did both of them somehow wind up with the same actual birthday as persons? That would be very unusual. Um, Fouad says, can you talk about how the will to power and self-affirmation of one's drives relate to each other? So if we're ta you're talking about Nietzsche, right? So Nietzsche thinks that everything involves or is will to power. It's basic to his metaphysics. Um, <coughs> self-affirmation. Now, self-affirmation of one's drives, 
self-affirmation drives are, are not exactly the same thing. Drives can be repressed. As a matter of fact, exercising your will to power, you will in fact repress something of yourself because you can't, you know, let a thousand flowers or a thousand drives bloom at every single moment. You'd, you'd be just like a walking contradiction and fall apart, right? So as a coherent being, there is kind of, for Nietzsche, there is kind of like a hierarchy of things, you know, governing, ruling each other. And um, you can kind of pick between them and you can figure out where you got your ideas about what should be in charge of what came from. Did it, did it get, you know, like pushed on to you by the society that you're a member of and there were incentives to buy into it so you wouldn't get, you know, beaten or ridiculed or stuff like that. Or you get to hold on to your job. Are you, are you, you know, finding yourself not able to indulge your, your, your drives due to repression and then feeling resentful about that? I mean, those are all things that you would, you would, um, take into account, right? Uh, Ed Keeley, any thoughts on Domenico Lacerdo's Nietzsche, the aristocratic rebel? Haven't read it. <laughs> A lot of people asking me today about books and authors I haven't read. Here's another one. David Mondero, do you think Peter Calvage's book, Logic of Desire, is a good introduction to Hegel? I don't think I've read it. I mean, the title sounds familiar. Maybe I read it if, if it was around back in grad school, but I can't remember anything about it. So, Diogenes, I've been accepted as an external reviewer for an international undergraduate journal. Will it be worth my time? It'll be worth your time if you make it worth your time. Um, I, I mean, I don't know you or what sort of things you've got going on. Um, or what you expect this to pay off in. As a reviewer of a journal, you don't do it because it's going to be a great use of your time as opposed to other things. You do it as like service to the intellectual community. And if you think that's a good use of your time, then I guess it, it will be. You know, it's also kind of cool to see how things work from the inside, although it's like the old proverbial you know, making the sausage, if you're squeamish, you don't want to see how the sausage is made. Editorial review processes are not always as fair and balanced and uh, well run as as you would hope that they are. Um, but I, it might be a good might be a good um, experience for you. You know, I, I, I would definitely do it. All right. Um, Zeno says, can an idea be original? Can there be any more original ideas? More original ideas all the time. I mean, that's one of the fortunate things about our time is we have so much access to stuff. It, now, it depends on what you mean by original. If you mean like nobody's ever come up with any bit of this before. Yeah. I mean, that doesn't happen very often. There's nothing that precludes it from happening in the future, but Oftentimes you can be quite original by reinterpreting things um, that, you know, haven't been adequately tapped out, you might say, right? Uh, Daddy Longlegs, is the Big Lebowski a gospel of Jesus? No. And as a matter of fact, I think it's really quite silly that people try to come up with something like Dudism or anything like that. Um, the movie is a movie. It's a fun movie. Uh, it's basically about a guy who doesn't have his shit together and, you know, says, you know, says man a lot and he's kind of a, a you know, fun character, but it's, it's not, I mean, you, you can turn anything into anything, but man, given the vast variety of cool stuff out there to like run your life with making the big Lebowski into that seems kind of silly to me. Um, Sam, any thoughts on the work of Bung Chul Han? Never heard of him again. So <laughs> nothing for nothing that I could uh say, right? Um Samuel, how precarious is the job market for teaching positions in the humanities? So the, the market isn't precarious, it's rather that people's livelihoods are precarious, right? The market is the market, and it is what it is. And it's always been a crapshoot or a lottery. Um, the only the only real leverage of which would be um, arbitrary things like who you know and where you went to school and stuff like that. It's not a, never been a fair market. 
Uh, it was crap back when I got done with graduate school in the very early 2000s. It's worse now. Um, as a matter of fact, there isn't a single market. There's a bunch of different markets, right? And they could be at the same institution. So, for example, um, you know, a place like Marquette down the road where they 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 basically we know this now they lied about uh, the financial difficulties that they were in and used it to phase out a lot of positions um, and to try to push people into early retirement and then not not fill their positions. Um, kind of typical for uh, administrators, especially at, at at universities that claim they have some sort of social mission. You know, um, they they don't. Um, their behavior shows that. They're doing something different. They're they're spending money on, I think, a sixty million dollar new business school. Uh, they have they're sitting on a uh, massive, massive endowment. Um, and so, you know, there's the market for like full time tenure track jobs, and Marquette will sooner or later be advertising for some of them, and then they'll do the typical song and dance stuff of putting out advertisements and all these poor bastards will have to apply to it and jump through a bunch of hoops only basically to get ghosted. Uh, and then, you know, four of them will get brought to campus or three of them will get brought to campus and they'll do their song and dance. And then the committee will choose. And then the Dean will decide whether or not they actually get to hire the person or not. Um, and then there's adjunct work. And, and I'll say too, by the way, Marquette, when I taught there as an adjunct, they were paying adjuncts fairly decent. The people who are really getting screwed over were the grad students who were were uh, not getting like full tuition reimbursement for the work that they were putting in at the place. And, and it's different from place to place to place. Um, but the job market is pretty bad. And it's not going to get better um, anytime soon in the United States because schools have an MO. They are highly reliant on um, non-tenure track, mo most often adjunct labor for filling their classrooms and students and parents don't usually know what the, the actual status is. They're always, you know, surprised. Like when I teach my business ethics class and I say, it takes only one of you and the tuition that you paid, the portion of tuition you paid for this class to actually pay my salary. Where's all the rest of the money going? Do you think, you know, they're clueless about that. Um, so the market is, is, is pretty bad. Is it as bad in other fields? I don't really know. I mean, I think history is in a real bind from what I can tell. English, maybe bad. I, I don't know, you know. All right. Uh, N and Q Center, what would you suggest reading lack of love and affection in childhood and have problems with socializing? Oh, uh, I don't know. Um, I don't know if there's like self-help books out there for that sort of thing, because I haven't uh, looked into that. Um, I remember there being um, books that I read quite a while back having to do with adoption and stuff like that. But that, that's kind of a separate issue. But I can't remember the, the names of them. So uh, daddy long legs, would it be stupid to say that Jesus is the ultimate stoic? It wouldn't be stupid. It'd just be silly. Um, why, why try to bring two things together that are clearly not the same thing? Uh, Jesus can be interpreted in many different ways from the, the, the few documents that we have about this guy. Um, stoic would not be one of them. Um, I mean, the, the one school that the quest for the historical Jesus often tries to align him with is not the Stoic school, but the Cynic school, right? Wandering around, engaging in diatribes, that sort of thing. Um, so it, it's just, you know, kind of it's trying to bring things together that don't really belong together. Um, all right. Uh, Garcia Eagle, it's not easy to be Stoic. We all have emotions. Well, then you definitely want to learn about what the Stoics have to say about emotions because it's super, super clear with just a minimal reading and Stoic stuff, real Stoic stuff, not, not, not the crappy fake stuff that's out there on, you know, this person who's trying to make a box website or something like that, but actual Stoic texts <clears throat> that the Stoics don't say you have to repress your emotions or that 
having no emotions is, you know, the point of, of stoicism. There are the good emotions, the eupathai, right? Um, joy, uh, rational fear or caution, and rational desire. So, you know, you always want to inform yourself better about that. You also don't want to use stoic in a lowercase s. Properly, you know, written, it's capital S, just like Aristotelian or Platonist, right? Um, oh, another question about somebody I haven't read. Rima, uh, what do you think of Luigi Pierson? Don't know. I've never read him. <laughs> so, right? uh, here's a question about metal from FF. Do you like genres like black, death metal, or dark uh, ambient? Not into those at all. Um, the... I, I'm into what nowadays they call traditional or we call it classic heavy metal stuff from the 70s and 80s. Um, some of the genres were developing back then, you know, the very first beginnings of, of black and death. The only black metal band that I like is, is Venom. And, and a lot of their stuff, you know, isn't isn't like that comparable to not what we nowadays call black metal. Um, you know, speed slash thrash slash power. These were all kind of loosely defined terms at the time. Uh, was developing, and I do like some some thrash. I like some power. I like some, of course, new wave of traditional heavy metal and some doom. I'm not into death metal. I'm not into black metal. I'm not into black and dark, you know, death metal. I'm not into uh, various other spinoffs. I mean, prog metal a little bit, but you know, not so much. Um, I think that kind of kind of got tapped out for me with like prong, for example um back in the 90s so uh you know when it comes to when it, i'm into the stuff that goes way way back and they're continuers more than than uh the other stuff all right um puffy mcfart i'm new to philosophy was wondering what a good chronological order of philosophical books are to help me better understand what other philosophers later on i you know again any any list that you can put together is always going to be like kind of triage. There's plenty of them out there. Um, I, I I don't see why we should take the limited time that we have here to try to come up with a, a list like that right off the top of my head. Um, Telly, have you read Philip Reef? What do you think of his work? I have, but I don't remember enough about his work to tell you anything because it's been a long time. Uh, Fraser says, I'm a, I'm a solicitor and attorney in Scotland, but I'm considering a career change. I'd like to be involved with philosophy as it is of great interest to me. Do you have any advice in this regard? Yeah. So that's, that's, that's good. Um, there are lots of ways that philosophy can be applied in public and practical and professional life. Um, I don't think that you have to like totally leave your field behind to do that. As a matter of fact, it's good to hold on to a day job, especially if you're going to start building something. There's a lot of interaction between philosophy and law historically, right? I mean, think about Jeremy Bentham. What was Jeremy Bentham's big thing? It's not the Panopticon. That was a side project. It's not just utilitarianism per se. He was about trying to change the British legal system, which was very punitive and irrationally so. That's Utilitarianism is is a, a way of trying to make things better, uh, and that's just one of so so many examples out there. Um, you're kind of fortunate in that if you're interested in things like Stoicism or other philosophies of life, there are many people in Great Britain who are doing that. I imagine, of course, that there's probably more of that going on in Edinburgh than there is if you go further north in Scotland. I don't know about Glasgow. Um, uh, and I don't know about the, the North that much, but there's a lot going on in, in, in the South. Um, but, you know, start looking for communities that you can get involved in, um, reading groups, um, events, things like that, that you can, you can participate in. That's a really great way to do it. There, we're fortunate too now that like, you know, we've got this vast international network th thanks to the internet. I mean, look at this, you know, there's people from all over the place participating in this, this AMA. Um, obviously this is a very unstructured activity and I don't know if anybody actually learns an awful lot in these, quite frankly, but there's, there's lots of other events that you can, you can participate in. Um, what else advice 
Um, you know, reading is going to be important. The one thing I will say is people will sometimes try to give you advice. Oh, don't read that person. Or you've got to read things in this order. You can read any way you want to. You know, you don't have to read things chronologically. Um, you don't have to have read Kant before you start reading Hegel. Does it help? Yes. But, you know, everything helps. But you don't have to feel restricted to where, oh, I have to do this before I, before I do this. Because the person who's telling you that, how do you know that they're not full of crap, you know? Um, there's ask 10 philosophers, what books you have to read, you get 10 different answers. So, um, you know, it's okay to rely on yourself and you don't have to like every philosopher that you're reading. You know, we mentioned Husserl earlier. I also mentioned Bentham just a minute ago. Both of them are boring to read. Both of them are also valuable to read. But if you find that like, it's not a great use of your time to try to read, you know, Husserl's, um, you know, ideas. You don't have to. Um, you can. There's so many other books that you can go on to and read instead. Uh, here's a really interesting question from Jay Chung. How do you think Kierkegaard would react to Nietzsche's work and vice versa? So we know that Georg Brandes actually did recommend Kierkegaard's work to Nietzsche. Um, we don't think that Nietzsche, as far as I remember, actually read it. He did read Dostoevsky, of course, you know, going off of Gord Brandes' um, recommendation. And so that's kind of cool. Um, Brandes is one of those few people who started to see the connections between them. Brand, uh, Brandes, Shestov, you know, a few others um, were, were kind of getting it, seeing this, this stuff. Um I think Kierkegaard would have said that, you know, Nietzsche probably has a few good ideas to offer, but that he's, you know, fundamentally off base on things. And that he's an example of where um, somebody who thinks that they're like standing apart from society is really being driven by this late, you know, uh, late modernity, which is very pagan. And, and uh, you know, I think that's probably what Kierkegaard would have said, but I don't know. That's, that's a, that's a good question. I'm sure there's some speculation about, about that out there. Um, let's see. John says, thanks for the helpful content over the years. Helped me stand out to in, in my um, undergraduate philosophy classes and is continuing to help me now in MAT classes. Good. I'm, I'm glad. You know, that's, that's very nice. Um, you never know how much stuff is getting traction or helping people out or stuff like that. So it's always, it's always great to, to hear that. Um, Thomas Lodger, are you a fan of postmodern philosophy? Depends on which postmodern philosophy you're talking about. I mean, I tend to use the word late modern rather than postmodern because it means so many different things to different people, including crazy crap that it was never intended to mean by people uh, who, you know, read Stephen Hicks or Jordan Peterson or pick, pick the flavor of the day of the right winger who's against the postmodern, you know. Uh, but yeah, I, I mean, I like a lot of people that that get called postmodern um, for different reasons, you know. Uh, Samita has got a great question here. Um, any tips for finding a purpose in going to an analytic university when you're a continental guy feeling sort of drained from all the analytic stuff? Yeah, so if you're, I mean, if you're at a place like that, obviously find um, stuff outside of your classes that you can use to connect up with other people who are interested in what you're interested in. Fortunately, again, we have the internet. We have like all sorts of cool reading groups and, and you know, things to participate in. Um, and, you know, there's, there's stuff to learn from the analytics. It's not all, it's not all crazy, you know, uh, logic chopping garbage, right? Um, I even think that, you know, we probably, if we want to be good philosophers, we should study what we could call a classic analytic canon. I mean, you should read, um, Russell's uh, philosophy of logical atomism. So you can be like, wow, that's what people were into then. And holy crap, that, you know, there's a lot of tech bros that are into that now. Then they say the same damn thing. And here's why it doesn't work. And you should read Wittgenstein. And you should read pe great, great people that people don't read, like John Wisdom, um, who actually liked, you know, quite a few continental figures. Iris Murdoch is another prime example of somebody like that. Um, and you should, you know, you should read Ryle and you should read Austin and, and it's, it's worth learning this stuff. Um, 
and realize that that a lot of the analytics don't have any idea just how restrictive and deforming their points of view unfortunately are so you can be like oh you poor bastards you know this is this is the way that you think philosophy has to be done but definitely branch out you know and find find other other things like that all right so we're getting it's 123 now um i'm going to just start grabbing things that i can easily answer rather than trying to do them in in order um because we're we're not going to be able to get to everybody. Um, all right, let's see here. Um, here's an interesting one. What should I expect if I graduate with a philosophy PhD at age thirty-seven? Same stuff as if you graduated at thirty or 57, <clears throat> um, not a lot of jobs in the university, lots of prospects for doing work outside of the university. If you actually did earn a PhD, you've shown that you've got research skills and you should be good at presenting things. So there's a lot of things that you could do with a PhD. You're just, you're going to have to have some other, you know, skills that, that can tie in with that. Right. Uh, Brandon Paul, why does Western philosophy seem so disconnected to Buddhism? I spent so much time searching for answers and seem to have found them in Buddhism. It seems crazy. West and East are connect, aren't connected more. Well, Buddhism itself, there's no such thing as Buddhism. There's all sorts of schools of Buddhism, uh, you know, older Theravada schools, a host of Mahayana schools, Vajrayana schools. There's even newer schools now as well, right? You know, like uh, Hans committed Buddhism and stuff like that. So anybody who starts talking about Buddhism as a whole, you can't possibly read all the Buddhist literature there is in your entire lifetime anyway, any more than you can uh, all the Taoist literature or Confucian literature. So, you know, let, let's avoid kind of Orientalism and, and, and typecasting that way. Why isn't there much contact between Buddhism and Western philosophy? Um, well, because it was happening over largely in India and, and, and China, and then their you know respective cultural spheres. Um, there's there's some connections. I mean, who do, who does talk about it? Schopenhauer does, right? How well does he understand it? Uh, you know, we know more about it now than he had the opportunity to do. But there's you know there's plenty of people who do talk about it. So you just got to go out there and, and look for it. Neo-anarchist, will you ever do a video on Max Stirner and why wasn't he included in the existentialist or German philosophy series? I didn't do a German philosophy series, so I, I don't have a clue what you're talking about there. Why wasn't he included in the existentialist series? Because I didn't get to everybody in the, the series, right? Um, why didn't I uh, shoot stuff on Unamuno, who's more important than Stirner? You know, why didn't I ever get around to all that stuff? You know, limited time, right? It's not an anti-Stirner thing. Uh, he's an interesting guy. He's kind of a, a limit point in, in philosophy. Will I do videos on him? Um, I've got thumbnails, actually, for uh, videos that I intended to do a long time ago, but it's always a matter of finding the time, right? We all get the same 24 hours every day. I shoot videos mainly based on what I'm teaching in my classes. If you want Sterner videos and you really, really want them, feel free to commission and pay for my time to do them. I've done that for Nietzsche videos and Heidegger videos in the past. Um, anybody can, you know, bump stuff up higher in the queue if they want to, but they got to like, you know, they got to be willing to, to make it worth not doing the other stuff that I'm doing and doing the thing that they're really interested in, you know? Um, all right, let's see here. Mon Spider, in fear and trembling on the difference between Knights of Infinite Resignation and Faith, it seems the former is susceptible to be becoming a nihilist of sorts. Would this be completely off base? Uh, yeah, it would be completely off base. It, when, you, when you actually read um, why, the, why the Knight of Resignation, Infinite Resignation, is still cool with things, it's because they recognize some higher value that the thing that they would really like has to be sacrificed for. Now, a nihilist, there aren't any higher values, right? The higher values, as Nietzsche says, devalue themselves. So 
so long as you're a knight of infinite resignation and that value still holds value for you, you're not going to be a nihilist, right? Now, could is it possible that there could be like some sort of revelation to you? Oh man, I bought into this thing and it was all bullshit. Yeah, that happens to people all the time. Um, but if the single instantiation turned out to be bullshit. Like think about, you know, a, a commitment to a political party on the basis of this party is like furthering humankind and, you know, writing injustice and stuff like that. Those are, those are transcendent values. Um, and the party itself is an empirical instantiation of that. If the party turns out to be a whole bunch of corrupt assholes, that doesn't mean that those values no longer hold. But a lot of people you notice when their favorite instance of it breaks down they're like oh this was all bullshit too you know um then you were never really a knight of infinite resignation that that might be an actual test for it so that that's a good thing to bring up I, i'd say um all right we got a, a little bit of time left um do 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 All right, so uh, Mike Run, your talks made me interested in McIntyre's works. Tips for on um, dealing with his works from a non-philosophy background. Um, just you know, read the works, and when you get bogged down, um, read the people that he's talking about. I guess you know, uh, or or look them up in some way or something like that. I mean, McIntyre is a rather terse writer. He's he's uh, he's not a bad stylist, um, but he he can be a, a you know rather tough. Look at the examples that he uses. I, I would also I wouldn't jump right into After Virtue. Maybe you read his History of Ethics first. That might be helpful, and maybe some of his his works before After Virtue, like Against the Self Images of the Age. You know his cultural criticism stuff, and then you know kind of be prepared to work because he is going to make you work for it. Um, he's very, he's very um, good to, to, uh, to work on. Um, ben has another question here. Will you ever do a series on Bataille? Maybe down the line if I, if I'm teaching Bataille, but same sort of thing. If you want it bumped up, you can commission my videos. Um, I'm, I'm receptive to that. You know, Here's a good one to go out on. Dennis Dijkstra. Um, I just started my master's degree in applied ethics, and I find it quite intimidating to come up with my own stances between all these philosophers' thoughts. You don't have to come up with your own stances. You don't have to be original. Right now, as a master's student, you're supposed to be learning and, you know, taking stabs at things and, and experimenting, you know, the... You get to play around with stuff. You get to come in and maybe say, you know, I kind of think that virtue ethics is where it is. And then if you want to reject that two years later and say, I'm a utilitarian now, you get to do that because it's your brain and it's your education. You know, um, nobody is going to, uh, you know, there, there's, there's nothing bad that's going to happen if you change your views. Or if you say, you've heard me say a lot in, in this, like people are asking about this person and that, I don't know that person, you know, it's okay to say that it's okay to accept your limitations. It doesn't make you a, a bad person or not a real student or anything like that. As a matter of fact, if you're coming in as a student, you shouldn't know everything and you, you shouldn't know everything even when you leave, you know, w with a PhD. Right, a PhD is just sort of a license to get out there and continue doing more research. Um, it's a, it's really unfortunate that we we have a lot of um, we have a lot of people and schools that want too much of their students. You know, the the notion that like, oh, I got to publish something, uh, you know, as, as a master's student so I can apply for a PhD uh, slot somewhere. That's bullshit. And I understand that there are some places like that. It's bullshit that they put that sort of pressure on master's students. It's bad pedagogy. It's bad formation. And you got to, you know, you look at the people that are pushing that and you got to say, these are unwise people. I don't, I, I don't want to go study with them because clearly something is gone haywire and, and they're thinking about stuff. So you don't, you don't have to 
come up with your own stances. It's okay early on to be sort of like tracing out somebody else's lines. You will eventually, you know, if you keep at it, you will start coming up with your own stuff and saying, well, I, I like this about the utilitarians. These are some things I don't like. Now you're coming up with something that's more your own. So I think that's a, that's a good one to, to go out on. Um, I didn't get to everybody's stuff. I never do. So um, sorry about those, but glad we could talk about the things that we got to. And uh, I'm going to go have something to eat before I have to get on with my next thing for the day. Hope all of you have a great, uh, whatever it is, afternoon here, morning for some people, evening, nighttime for others, and I'll see you next time.